Now I know what you're thinking. That wasn't a story about Jesus being born. Well, that's coming tonight. But today, we're celebrating the last Sunday in the Advent season. Uh, But before I get into that, welcome to Bethany Christian Church. There's a lot of places I know you could be on a Sunday, but I'm very grateful that you've decided to join us today. And Merry Christmas. So like I said, today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and we had this really weird thing happen this year, where the last Sunday in Advent and Christmas Eve actually fell on the same day. But all month long, I've been talking about Advent. And for those of you who don't know, Advent is a traditional church season where we anticipate the birth of Jesus Christ. So on the first week of Advent, we talked about the hope that this season brings. The second week, we talked about peace, God's peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And then last week, our third week of Advent, we talked about joy and the joy that this season brings, the joy that was sent into the world when God put on flesh and became like us. And now today, In Advent 4, we talk about love. As you know, I've been preaching all month from the prophet Isaiah, but today we're taking a look at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is the story of King David, who's known as a man after God's own heart. David is known as many things. He's known as a warrior king. He's known as a father. He's also known as a sinner. He betrays friends, he lusts for power, and he gives in to a variety of temptations. And like us, David is not perfect. But like some of us, and unlike others of us, David recognizes something. That when he messes up, or when things are going great, he needs God. And God accomplishes a lot through David's life because of David's realization that he needs God in his day-to-day life. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, through David's story, let us learn how love builds. Let us learn the great love that David had for you and the even greater love You've shown to him and to all of us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, many, many years ago, when I was in college, I went to class round the clock pretty much all year. I studied during the regular semesters, I took classes in the summer, and I even took classes during what we called our January term, or J-term. And I was obsessed with learning while I was an undergraduate. And it's because I was very blessed to be the first Wilcox to ever get a bachelor's degree. I mean, I was ready to get everything I possibly could out of my college experience. I was constantly engaged in all of my classes except statistics. But honestly, I I talked with most of my professors for hours after class had ended, and I went up to office hours in the religious studies department. I just couldn't get enough. I mean, college opened up a whole new world to me. Anyway, in in my second year, I became friends with the school's chaplain, Stephanie. Now, Stephanie was a great chaplain. She could engage me on a spiritual level. She loved the questions I brought to her. And she also loved to just nerd out about my schoolwork with me. And while I was wrapping up my degree program, Stephanie invited me to church and encouraged me to take a gap year between my last year of college and going to graduate school. Now, at the time, I was gearing up to be a professor of religious studies. 
So I figured it might be a good idea to get some, you know, real world experience before I went off to Chicago to finish my studies. I mean, plus, I was only about to turn 21 at the time, so I was still pretty young to be getting myself into a graduate program. I mean, either way, for the next year, I moved to Texas, and I, I went into this gap year program, and after just a few weeks, I thought, man, I am such an idiot. I should have just applied to grad school. What am I doing here? I don't like Dallas. I don't know if you've ever been to Dallas, but Dallas is a place that I affectionately refer to as the concrete wasteland. You can barely see a tree in sight. And I grew up in Virginia, in the woods, so it was not for me. But while I was in Dallas, I was worried. I was, I was saying, I, I'm, not ever, I'm not sure I'm ever going to connect with my roommates. I'm farther away from my friends and my family now. God, why am I here? And it got so bad that by the time it came around for the next round to apply to my graduate program, I doubted that I even belonged there anymore. By this point in my life, I had, I had piled on doubts about my career, my life, and my faith. And I didn't know what to do. And because of all these doubts, I took another year, another year off from applying to this graduate school. And so I went home. I worked for Geico for six months. I was just saving money. And then I headed out onto what I thought was going to be the greatest adventure of my entire life. I planned on doing a 2,600-mile hike on the west coast of the United States. It's called the Pacific Crest Trail. But I only made it 100 miles until I hurt myself. So by the time I got back from the trail, I knew I'd gotten into the Divinity School at least. And the next phase of my life was ahead of me. So let us open up the Bible together. We're going to open up to 2 Samuel. If you're taking a pew Bible, it's on page 299. You can also use a phone Bible if that works for you. It's typically what I use. It's easier to get to for me these days. But we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. All right, starting in verse 1. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling, and wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people, will not oppress them anymore as they did in the beginning 
and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So up to this point, David's been through a lot. David was a shepherd boy. David fought Goliath and won. He took over the throne from Israel's first king, King Saul. And now he's built himself a palace. And now he's got time to rest. And so he takes a moment to reflect. And the text tells us that David turns to the prophet Nathan and says, well, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. To which Nathan replies, David, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. You know, naturally, I think David senses that there's something wrong with the fact that he lives in a nice new palace But the place where Israel believes that God dwells has taken a back seat. The place where where God dwells is only in a tent. It isn't even as nice as the place that David lives. And so David decides, I'm going to build a proper place for God to dwell. I'm going to build God a temple, a permanent dwelling place. And wouldn't we do the same thing in this case? When God blesses us and helps our plans to prosper, many of us feel like it's good and right to give back to God, right? When God helps us get the promotion, when God helps save our marriage, when God helps our kids or our friends or our family member to see that, well, what we were telling them, that's that's really what's best for them. We think, we, like, we want to thank God for that, right? Well, maybe not all of us. I mean, some of us would say, I told you so. <laughs> well, naturally, I think when, when we get a return on what we've been investing in, when we, things go right, we want to build something for God after God has delivered on those promises, what we've been praying for, because love builds. But as we just read, God tells David no. God tells David that David needs to get his house in order first. God tells David that now is not the right time to build. Now is not the right time to build a temple because God has other opportunities for David right now. And maybe like David, you and I are trying to build a temple when God wants us to build a dynasty. Love builds. Love builds, but don't we want to be building the right thing? Look, God's no to David wasn't a rejection. God's no to David was for something. In the same way that my plans didn't pan out in my timeline, David's didn't either. In fact, David never even built God's temple. His son, Solomon, did. 
I mean, even though I was planning on blasting my way through degree after degree after degree until I had my PhD and everything was right for me, God had other plans for me. I mean, it were, if it weren't for Stephanie, I would not have met my pastor and mentor in Texas. If it weren't for Stephanie, I wouldn't have met one of my best friends in Texas. If it weren't for Stephanie, I wouldn't have gotten 90% of the workplace skills that I use here at Bethany Christian Church. I can tell you honestly, graduate school didn't give me those skills. A little nonprofit in Richardson, Texas did. And if it weren't for God letting me doubt, I wouldn't have gone to graduate school when I did. If it weren't for God letting me doubt, I likely wouldn't have met another one of my best friends who teaches me so much about God and God's heart for me and God's heart for you. And if it weren't for God letting me doubt, there's even a good chance I would have never met Brianna. I wouldn't have met the love of my life. God was saying, no, Landon, now is not the time. God wasn't rejecting me. God's no was for something. And I know there's someone here right now who's tired of hearing no. You're in the middle of that no right now. At every turn, you're wondering, why can't I build this career that I've been working so hard at? Why can't I build security? Why can't I get my finances in check and get out of this debt that's hanging over my head? Why can't I build healthy and thriving relationships anymore? Why can't I build my health back up to where it once was? Why can't I get out of this, this funk that COVID has left me in since we were locked down? You fill in the blank. I think so many of us are trying to build something and life is just pushing on us. Saying no. Now is not the time. We're telling ourselves, no, you can't do that. No, you aren't worthy to have that. But that's not God rejecting you. I'd go so far as to suggest that I think if you lean in and ask, I think God might have something else for you first. If only you had ears to hear what it was. God might be saying no to what you think you should do first. But like David, we might be ready to build the wrong things first. God's no was for something. For me, God's no was so that I would be prepared for where I am today. I mean, God was building something with and within me. God was building something for us. This is exactly what God was doing with David. God said no to a temple because God was going to build David's house into an everlasting dynasty. And David had some things he needed to take care of first because God was going to make the lineage of David known forever. The truth is, King David's earthly dynasty in the kingdom of Israel lasted about 400 years. Eventually, Israel was overthrown and God's people were back in captivity. They were ruled by several different empires until finally, around the turn of the century, the Roman Empire was preparing to take a census and start a whole new calendar. And around that same time, God decided to make good on a promise that he made to David about a thousand years prior. A descendant of David was born, and his name 
was Jesus. And Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God had made to David. The house of David now reigns for eternity because God himself put on flesh and lived among us. And while Jesus, the God-man, did die, he rose three days later and now reigns forever. God's no wasn't to reject King David. God's no was a matter of survival. It was for David's lineage to eventually end with Jesus being born. And I think often we try to build things with good intentions only for God to say no. But this is because God is directing us to a greater purpose in life. Accepting what God says no to might require the same or more faithfulness than what we happily carry out when God says yes. I'm going to say that again. Accepting what God says no to might require the same or more faithfulness than what we happily carry out when God says yes. When I was going through my years of schooling and in between, I'll be honest, I was feeling a lot of friction with life and with God. I think I could have used this message then. What God had said no to, I just couldn't understand why. But now I know why. A wise man once said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. I didn't know then that what I was going to get was skills and relationships that would change my life forever. But that's just it. Life can only be understood backwards. As we close the season of Advent this morning and move towards celebrating the birth of Jesus tonight, the greatest love story ever told, as we move to celebrate that birth tonight, go out from here asking what love is building in you what love is building for you. What is God saying no to so that God might build something even greater in your heart and in the lives of those around you? You know, I wonder, if we let go of what God is saying no to, would it be possible that we could find that greater promise that we could find God's yes. Amen.